en este taller 3 con instrumentos de protección, gestión y ordenación de la presencia de agua en el paisaje. En realidad dice que hay un debate general en el que la señora Julia Tobikova y yo mismo, yo me llamo Eladio Fernández Galeano, seremos los moderadores, pero habiendo siete presentaciones eh, y solo media hora y larga, eh, sea quizá difícil. Eh, entonces, sin más dilación, si a la señora Tobikova le parece bien, vamos a invitar al doctor Constantin Ananitschev, que es eh, experto en la relación del territorio de un territorio muy grande, que es Rusia, pero en particular del Blas de Moscú, eh, la ciudad más grande del continente europeo. Así que retos no le faltarán. Tiene usted la palabra. Sí. Uh... So, what, uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank uh, the governments of Spain, of Andalusia, and of uh, the city of Seville for their kind invitation, for their hospitality. I also would like to thank the Council of Europe and personally Madame Magillon de Jean Pons, uh, who provided my, uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, so, what to say? The issue of relations between water and landscape cannot be described in a brief introduction. Thus, I will uh, limit myself to some uh, general consideration. Water, its presence or absence, abundance or deficit, even, uh, even or uneven distribution, uh, defines the type of any natural landscape. If water covers 100% of land, uh, we can call it a sea or an ocean. If we have a surface, uh, no surface or groundwater supply, when we see a desert. But even in deserts, we often find traces of uh, former water activities. For many centuries ago, the climate and sea level were different. When we deal with man-made uh, man landscapes, we notice that any human intervention into natural uh, water balance affects landscape, and vice versa. Any landscape modification uh, lays a certain impact on the quantity and quality of local waters. Many ancient cities, as you know, have suffered from distortion of water balance, became depopulated and uh, were finally abandoned. Degradation of water resources and landscapes happened and still continue to happen. Uh, where, uh, where people ignore their uh, interconditionality, mutual, how to say, dependence of water and landscape. A classical example from school, you know, uh, people cut trees near a river to increase arable land or pasture. Uh, the river goes dry, agricultural yields drops rapidly. Uh, what about urban landscapes? Using the opportunity, I would like to say a word about the issue I'm currently studying. A comfortable modern city, as we understand the term comfort, must provide for proper uh, architecture, infrastructure, etc., and uh, as well comfortable topography. This minimized number and amplitude of steep hills and gullies. For centuries, my own city, Moscow, was trying to smooth topography and to hide numerous minor rivers and streams within Moscow in order to develop a better infrastructure and uh, obtain new sites uh, within already built up areas. The efforts resulted in a completely independent system of rain sewage oriented on the needs of buildings and roads. Over 90% of former rivers exist as underground pipe flows, uh, 
disconnected from uh, uh, surface water and uh, receive water from snow melting and heavy rains uh, only through connecting holes on streets and squares. In many cases, the distances between those holes and uh, the former rivers now piped are so large uh, and uh, collecting capacities are so insufficient uh, that any snow melt or any heavy rain results uh, in a flood in the city. Uh, every spring and every heavy summer uh, rain, uh, you show that streets and yards suddenly show you the ancient topography. You uh, suddenly see the ancient network of rivers and uh, smaller tributaries. Uh, despite the topography is almost flat and you see only paved roads, nevertheless, uh, the nature always has its revenge. Uh, but doesn't, uh, I don't see, uh, I wouldn't say that the situation is critical. Uh, human casualties and material losses are much smaller than those from fires or traffic incidents. Nevertheless, floods do not help sustainable city development. Uh, I'm glad that new construction planned or started already uh, has a certain respect for natural topography, surface and underground water streams and vegetation. Uh, but what has to be done about the old built up city districts? Is it possible to make them more hydrologically friendly? I hope it is. And uh, one more abstract, if I had time, I didn't include it in my speech. Uh, because I've just started this research. I don't have any team, only uh, two uh, volunteers who help me and uh, two private sponsors who, uh, how to say, decided to finance my research. So I hope later, in a year or two, I will uh, be able to report on the first results of this research and the, my first negotiations with uh, city officials. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Konstantin, for, uh, for sharing the experience from Moscow with us and uh, mentioning how important a spatial planning of young urban landscape is uh, for dealing with water. Uh, next, I would like to invite Alberto Cagnato, uh, who would have a presentation about the rivers to travel the landscape, landscape trails. Please. Je m'ajoute au remerciement à, à l'Espagne, à l'Andalousie et à Séville. Séville, c'est une, une ville où, on, dès qu'on arrive, on se trouve à l'aise et parfois même plus à l'aise que chez soi. Je remercie euh, aussi la, la Commission européenne du paysage et le Conseil d'Europe pour cette invitation. Euh, moi, euh, je fréquente la, 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 les, les réunions de la Convention depuis Cetinie, au Monténégro. Je préfère parler de lieux plutôt que, que de dates. Et je profite pour remercier tous les lieux, tous les pays que j'ai eu l'occasion d'apprécier au cours de ces années. Les, la, cette présentation est la, le fruit de cette fréquentation. Et je dois adresser un remerciement spécial à Magellan 
parce qu'elle a su créer une atmosphère de, de, de confiance réciproque qui est, qui est extrêmement important entre le niveau européen, le niveau du, du Conseil de l'Europe, et le niveau local, ce qui est une, une, une circonstance assez rare. Bien entendu, s'il si, si y a quelque chose de bien que je vais dire et communiquer, le mérite est à Magellan. S'il y a des responsabilités, euh, au contraire, les, les responsabilités sont à moi. Je vous propose une randonnée, une randonnée au cours, de, le long d'un fleuve, qui est l'Epiave, qui est le, le fleuve principal de la région de la Vénétie, et, mais aussi au long de l'histoire de la Vénétie, pas toute, ne vous inquiétez pas, et, euh, et Face à, euh, au titre, la première question qu'on se pose, c'est quel a été le rôle de l'eau dans la culture et civilité de Venise C'est une question qui paraît assez banale, mais parce que il y a, parce que une, c est, c est, ils sont presque synonymes, Venise et, et eau. Mais peut-être peut que, que je, je vais essayer de, de, de débanaliser cette cette euh, euh, impression en introduisant le conseil des euh, paysages comme euh, système de relations et aussi euh, voir au cours de l'histoire si au-delà du rôle reconnu à l'eau au-delà des fonctions attribuées à l'eau, il y a aussi des valeurs attribuées à l'eau Donc, euh, moi, je suis euh, un urbaniste de formation et de profession euh, euh, urbaniste. Je m'occupe des de territoires depuis presque une cinquantaine d'années. Et j'ai je, je euh, euh, l'habitude de parler avec le territoire en utilisant le langage du territoire. Le langage de, du territoire est le paysage. Il, le territoire nous parle constamment, c'est nous qui nous, ne l'écoutons pas. Il suffit de donner un peu d'attention au, euh, au territoire à travers le paysage pour éviter les dégâts qu'on qu va voir et profiter de tout ce que, que le, le territoire est en mesure de nous donner. Mais, euh, mais, pas, -à -dire, mais là, il faut choisir certains lieux qui sont plus... Euh, euh, propre à cette fonction qui permet ce euh, dialogue. Et j'ai euh, choisi le sentier. Le sentier, c'est euh, euh, une voie où euh, on marche à pied et on a l'occasion de dialoguer avec tous ceux qui nous entourent. Euh, la première chose qui, qui, qui nous a dit, euh, les Piave, il nous a dit écoute, voilà, c'est... Qu'est-ce que c'est l'eau pour, la, euh, pour Venise Il y a cet édito di Ignazio, il s'appelle, au du, du, du début du euh, e siècle, qui euh, dit d'une façon immuable et perpétuelle que ceux qui touchent à l'eau, ceux qui, qui portent préjudice à l'eau, portent préjudice à la patrie. Donc, c'est une, une euh, identification de l'eau avec la patrie. Non. Une, une attribution des valeurs de l'eau à la euh, 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 patrie. Il y a, en définitive, une symbiose entre société civile, communauté et eau. Mais pas seulement l'eau. On quitte pour, pour l'instant Venise, on va sur la terre ferme et on va parler un moment de villa vénitienne. Les villas vénitiennes sont connues pour la beauté architecturale, mais qui a trop absorbé d'attention. 
les vilains vénitiens vous, euh, euh, dans la région de Venise, et imaginez-vous qu'ils sont à, à l'heure actuelle recensés par l'Institut régional des de villas vénitiens, ils sont à l'heure de 4000, dont la partie du fuel, il y en a encore 500. Euh, si vous imaginez que la région de, de Veneto, elle a 576 communes, vous pouvez saisir la dimension de ce phénomène. Donc, quand on parle des euh, villas vénitiens, on doit parler d'un système agraire. Ouais, et, et on on s'approche euh, chez moi, j'habite euh, Treviso, qui est, qui est le, le territoire euh, le, euh, déjà cultivable et arable à l'époque vénitienne, parce que le littoral est marécageux. Donc, et en, en 1344, la ville et son territoire s'est dédié à Venise pour sauvegarder ses statuts. Et ils ont demandé en contrepartie des interventions euh, et finalisé à euh, rendre fertiles des terrains stériles. Vous voyez à nous les, 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 les fumes Piave. Ils ont créé des, des canaux pour rendre fertile la la partie de la plaine, de, euh, disons à, à l'ouest de Treviso. Le résultat, c'est celui-là. On est en 1556, non avec cette villa palladienne qui est patrimoine de l'UNESCO. Mais voilà le système cardio vasculaire qui soutient l'activité la, 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 agricole, la ferme qui était la villa vénitienne. Donc, et on a vu dans la, la slide avant, la relation entre le Piave et, et la ville, on est à une quinzaine de kilomètres. Mais ce que, qui, qui nous reste, c'est la perception de, de la photo qu'on a vue de la ville. On a perdu la connexion du reste du territoire, et ça même grâce à une politique paysagère discutable. Mais Venise, je disais, c'est un, un système de relations. Personne, et, 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 pas tous sont, savent que Venise est bâtie euh, dans l'eau, mais sur le bois. Sous Venise, ce qui soutient Venise, c'est une forêt de, de troncs d'arbres euh, qui, qui, qui sont enterrés non, et qui font des supports. Et le bois vient de la montagne à travers le Piave. Donc c'est un système, un système qui, qui, a, qui a continué pendant des siècles jusqu'à la fin du XIXe euh, siècle. Et, la, et ce, que, ce que vous voyez, ce sont les radeaux qui amenaient soit le bois, soit les, les autres marchandises au long de tout le système du Piave, des de relations du Piave. On arrive à, à, à 1805 6 euh, Napoléon est arrivé en 1797. Et il, il a gagné sa bataille à Rivoli Veronese, qui est à côté de Vérone. Et vous, vous, vous tous, vous, vous connaissez la rue de Rivoli euh, à Paris. Eh bien, la rue de Rivoli, c'est Rivoli Veronese. Ça, ça a été au mois de, de janvier de 1797. Il arrive au mois de mars à rencontrer euh, le Piave et il, il se rend compte immédiatement avec une lecture, comme on pourrait dire, paysagère, de, du rôle du Pilave au point de vue militaire. Il dit, bon, si jamais on a besoin d'une ligne de défense naturelle pour protéger Venise de l'Est, 
on a le piave. Et c'est une prophétie qui s'est se, concrétisée un siècle euh, euh, après avec la première guerre mondiale et la défaite des de, de Caporetto, Corbalit, Arloen euh, et la ligne de défense et contre-attaque parce qu'il y a eu aussi un exode des populations euh, euh, qui devaient être protégées. Et ça, c'est, disons, une photo du Piave à l'époque de Napoléon. Parce qu'il y, y a eu, entre 1797 et 1815, une période entre euh, Napoléon et l'Empire euh, autrichien. Ouais, cette image, c'est très légère. C'est... C'est un, un avion de l'époque de, de la Première Guerre mondiale. C'est légère parce que, euh, disons que les populations locales n'aiment pas de parler de, de la Première Guerre mondiale. Il y a eu les célébrations du, de, du, 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 du centenaire qui, 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 ont, euh, qui, qui, qui ont fait faillite parce que les gens préfèrent de ne pas euh, en parler. Mais quand même, attribution de valeur, le Piave de, devient fleuve sacré à la patrie. Oui, euh, voilà le Piave. Euh, le, le Piave en, en italien, la Piave euh, en patois, ça va des Alpes jusqu'à la mer Adriatique. Ce sont 220 km euh, avec son euh, bassin. Euh, hydrographique. Au cours de, du XXe du, euh, siècle, ce qui se passe, je disais euh, tout à l'heure, que le système de transport et le rôle du PAB changent. On assiste à, à une, une croissance progressive de, de, de l'importance de, de l'hydroélectrique. On l'a vu hier en, en, en Géorgie, ce, ce qui se passe. Il, il y a eu des, des, des conflits très, très forts à la fin entre 1890 et 1900. Et en parallèle, on a créé un système hydraulique oui, et, et, et qui a amené à ça. Ça, c'est la catastrophe du voyant. Euh, et que euh, et je, je crois que vous connaissez, qui a démontré la fragilité du système euh, hydraulique et, la, et, et a amené une situation où il y a un bassin hydrographique euh, euh, malade d'anémie parce qu'il n'y a pas d'eau et un système hydraulique inefficace parce que le, la, 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 la base, le soutien de tous les systèmes était le, le bassin du Vaillant. Voilà ce qui s'est passé avec l'éboulement de, 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 de Vaillant. Voilà les conséquences et, 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 pas, du, pas tellement au changement climatique, ça c'est tout à fait normal. On a les inondations, on a la sécheresse, la, le changement climatique peut euh, augmenter la fréquence, mais euh, les, euh, les problèmes sont, euh, sont euh, ailleurs. Cette photo est emblématique de la multifonctionnalité qu'il y avait en en 1512, à la simplification, qui c'est une tresse multibras, à, une, à un, euh, un système monobras euh, actuel, avec une perte de, 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 de valeur, fonction, euh, et, qui est fa facilement euh, imaginable. Voilà. Euh, et ce qui se passe, c'est des formes, si le, le, le détachement entre euh, euh, eau et bassin est, est, est accompagné de, 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 du détachement entre population locale et fleuve. Il y a des formes spontanées, comme, comme celle-ci, des, des utilisations, euh, disons, euh, pas tellement 
licite. Il y a des formes même euh, extrêmes d'utilisation de, 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 de ces cas-là. Et, et, et le remède, le traitement à faire est, est, à notre avis, lié à, euh, au conseil de... Euh, il y a une faute, euh, je, je m'excuse en français, au euh, de plus au minimum vital et la directive cadre plusieurs fois c'était la 60 du 2000 mais les critères c'est c'est là c'est je, je passe directement au rôle du paysage en tout ça et je vous le laisse là donc il, il est dans le dans, dans le, dans le texte et, et, et aussi les rôles de l'observatoire du paysage. Et avec ça, j'ai terminé. Je vous invite à vous tous à, à venir à Venise, mais éviter les grands bateaux. Il faut peut-être utiliser un radeau comme celui-ci. Merci. Euh, pasamos a la segunda parte de perspectivas. Hay eh, cinco. We have five speakers and 15 minutes. Should be three minutes for the speaker. In any case, could all of you be brief? Thank you very much. By the way, I, in the name of them all, I thank the city of Sevilla, Magellan de Jean Pons, the Council of Europe, so you have to do it yourself. I join mine personally. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tabak uh, Adelapur from uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina has the word. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues. Uh, I must say I am great. I have great honor to be a participant and part of this conference. Um, and I will try to be short. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is far known by its clean and untouched waters. The special characteristic of the terrain of, in Bosnia and Herzegovina is the presence of the great number of water streams with abundance of waterfalls which are adorning the country's landscape. Their beauty consists of deep and steep canyons, effervescent whirlpools, docile meadows, and lush forests which are reflected on the clear and calm surface of the river. Unpolluted water is certainly one of the most important natural resources of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We can rightfully say that Bosnia and Herzegovina is the country of rivers due to the fact that around 262 rivers flow through it. The specificity of rivers in Bosnia and Herzegovina is also contained in the fact that uh, they compose its nat natural borders, Sava and Duna, the greatest part with Croatia on the west, Drina with Serbia on the east. One of the most beautiful rivers in Bosnia and Herzegovina is Pliva River along 32 kilometers located in the western part of Bosnia and Herzegovina and flowing west-east. It is springing in untouched nature of mountain Vitorog and its streams is ending in Yaitse, dramatically crashing down as waterfall in the Verbas River. A natural waterbed of the river Pliva is a typical example which confirms the assumption made by uh, Aldo Leopold. Uh, river flows are architects of their own geometry. The uh, whole region of Yaitse is rich in natural heritage which cannot be observed separately from the built heritage. Uh, we can see this dramatically, water flows. Uh, these two form, uh, forms are intertwined. The phenomenon of two phases and uh, the two fast sediments on the parts of the water streams of Verbas and Pliva River has its special roles. Apart from that, it represents a part of unique composition. This belt has its great value as a natural rarity. On the coast of, on the coast of Verbas and Pliva lies, lies one of the most beautiful cities in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
the city of waters, rocks, rocks and lights, the royal city, museum under the clear sky, the city with 29 natural monuments, city of Yaitse. Magnificent 21 meter tall waterfall is adorning the city center, making Yaitse unique in the world. The great historical significance and ambience value, important archeological findings and architectural objects and extraordinary natural beauty are placing Yaitse among the site of special importance from the standpoint point of heritage protection. The set of material and natural values represents unrepeatable qualities and is the result of human living in special social, historical, and cultural conditions. The historic urban area of Yaitse constitutes a self-contained spatial and topographical entity. There are two key factors in the appearance of Yaitse. The first is powerful impact of the morphology of the terrain and natural features such as rivers, cascades, and waterfalls, the tufa cliffs of sculptural form, etc., etc., and interaction between natural and the built environment. Here, the natural environment is so potent factor that everything that is built and set in that dramatic scenery acquires a specific lo local expression. Here, in fact, it is natural features that constitute the genius lossy. The most powerful feature of the town is, of course, the waterfall, which has become over the century of evolution of the structure of the town, the place with most powerful meaning of the town. The other factor is uh, the unbroken sequence of the material expression of human action of high cultural level and historical significance over the long period from the Roman Empire to modern history and which is even more significant, the long unbroken trajectory of urban history which makes this one the oldest towns in Bosnia. The continuity overlap and different historical strata contribute, contributes the complexity and richness of both the structure and the shape of the town. Uh, in the 15th century, uh, Yaitse was the seat of Bosnian kings, and in 1461 in Yaitse, the last Bosnian king Stjepan Tomasevic was crowned. Archaeological findings discovered in the very center of the town are pointing out that people in these areas lived even 6,000 years ago. Especially important are archaeological findings from the Roman age, age in the city itself, as well as the whole area. This includes the temple of the god Mithras and necropolis from fourth century. We saw it. Okay. In the year 1527, Yaitse has become the integral part of Turkish Empire. During the Ottoman rule in Yaitse, many educational and public institutions were built. This rule is replace, replaced by Austro-Hungarian monarchy in 1878. Uh, Yaitse is also famous by the fact that in 1943, Tito's Yugoslavia was established there on the second meeting of Avnoi. Uh, commission to Preserve National Monuments, 2004, adopted decision about historic urban area of Yaitse as National Monuments of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the natural and architectural ensemble of Yaitse is among the nine sites from Bosnia and Herzegovina inscribed on tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage. The border of zone under protection is conditioned by natural values of water streams, uh, tufa rocks, and morphology of terrain, as well as compositional elements in its uniqueness of natural conditions and human intervention. The central, the central rocky boulder with the citadels 
dominates above the city and could be seen completely equally from uh, all surrounding pos positions. Residential zone within the walls represents the zone of the greatest ambience value. Here we know the presence of, of most valuable objects which, which represents the main characteristic of uh, urban area. Um, I will try to be short. Um, residential area, several objects of high architectural values are also located within the complex, uh, and it is natural continuation of the outside of the walls and the represents, represents its bond with water and neighboring slope. Great co contribution to the environment in, this, uh, in the historic city of Yaitse and its immediate surrounding is given by the complex of uh, 20 water mills of the, on the river Pliva located between big and small Pliva Lake, which are represented by the extraordinary group of tra traditional objects. This environment has a notable natural, geological, and scientific value which is impossible to separate from its built heritage. The agency of cultural and historical heritage and development of touristic potential of the Yaise city in uh, the effort to better promote the city decided to reconstruct and again start up several water mills of, on Pliva River, uh, which are used to grinding the organic floor. I brought some beautiful pictures instead of my speech. The greatest destruction of historical structures happened during the war 1992-1995. Uh, uh, Almost every valuable residential object was, was significantly destructed and reduced to ruins. Though post-war economic situation, Complex social and political opportunity change national and social structure of popula population, indifference, low level of knowledge and awareness about values of cultural and historical heritage, as well as many harmful impacts which influence their, uh, their rapid deterioration. Post for semi chaotic reconstruction, illegal rather than legal, introduced the architecture in conspicuous dimensions, height materials, constructive, and architectural elements. Cultural and historical surrounding is directly and additionally degraded by materialization and new composed shapes. In such circumstances, develop development of regulation plan of cultural and historical nucleus with buffer zone is the urgent task of the society. The municipality of Yaitse has started developing the regulation plan of historical zone in Yaitse in 2007 and has assigned this task to the Faculty of Architecture in Sarajevo, the Institute of Architecture and Urbanism. We can, we can see here the main principle and goals set out in the regulation plan. I will not read all of them. Uh, nevertheless, Yaitse, as the place where extreme beauty is intertwined with the human heritage, will remain as one of the examples for learning about the strength of the ambience, as well as its, its need for safekeeping. And I will, uh, in the final, remember the sentence of Mrs. Magellan de jean -Paul and say that Yaitse is a place wh where we can meet the uh, symbolical and magical touch and or meaning of water, something like that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Emilia, for your, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as soon as I saw the picture of the Yaitse city, uh, it reminded me of uh, some picture from, my, uh, from a book from my childhood, and um, it, uh, it is, was really nice. I didn't know that such a city exists. Thanks again for your presentation. Now uh, I would like to introduce you, Irene Hadisieva from Cyprus. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you. 
Uh, I will be very, very practical and fast. Uh, I don't want to be between uh, you and, uh, and your lunch. Uh, so I will um, present uh, to you our new developments in Cyprus. And this is the National Integrated Coastal Zone Management Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, which was drafted in the framework of two very important uh, European Union's uh, documents. Uh, I would like to uh, say that even though the protocol was not ratified by Cyprus, since it was ratified by the European Union, it immediately um, um, uh, presents an obligation to the member states. Uh, the authors of the um, uh, strategy are a private consortium under the coordination of the, Debar the Department of Environment uh, with a uh, um, very big number of stakeholders, one of which is my Department of uh, Town Planning and Housing, and the funding was made uh, through the Fisheries Fund. The main outcomes uh, was the definition of the landward limit, analysis of policies and competencies that have an impact on the coastal zone, formulation of the strategy and formulation of the action plan. Uh, the definition of the landward limit of coastal zone uh, was made by multi-criteria analysis uh, in uh, three uh, criteria uh, categories. Uh, I would just like to point out in, in this slide that the landscape is, since we have the different perceptions of landscape, and this is a one a good example, how all the components of landscape are put in a, um, in a different uh, category. Um, you can recognize uh, uh, the threats. Many of the speakers refer to them, uh, but I would like to uh, stress the, uh, the, uh, the uses. Uh, one of, uh, of these is uh, industry, refineries, uh, and uh, the economy shift from agriculture to tourism. Uh, and Cyprus is a touristical country. Uh, however, I have chosen these examples uh, because you all know have the, the image uh, of um, uh, big uh, touristic developments. But here I would like to point out the problem of urban sprawl in agriculture uh, coastal areas. Uh, another uh, very new trend uh, in Cyprus is the real estate pressure, uh, which is uh, tending to uh, change the uh, urban uh, landscape uh, of the coastal area, especially in Limassol. Uh, the, the vision of the strategic plan, uh, it's, um, it's developed in the three axes of, um, uh, of um, um, of sustainable development, uh, having uh, in view the benefit of present and future generations, uh, but stressing a lot on the economic development. Uh, it talks about the resiliency, attractiveness, landmarks. The principles on which it is drawn is the holistic approach, ecosystemic, adaptive approach, land and sea interaction, participation, and consent. Uh, the strategic goals uh, are again on the three uh, axes of sustainable development, and it has uh, 16 priority axes. In the action plan, uh, the different uh, actions were um, uh, developed on these templates that were later evaluated uh, to, um, to propose 12 actions of primary importance, 14 actions of special importance, and 14 complementary actions. Uh, and here, I, as a spatial planner, I would like to stress the importance of the spatial uh, planning policies. And uh, because uh, um, maybe you'll think, uh, who am I to give this recommendation? Uh, let us hear the executive director of the Environmental uh, European Environmental Agency. When we look uh, at the biodiversity laws in Europe, which continues, I think we really have to go to the fundamental drivers and causes of that. And the first driver is clearly landscape fragmentation, bad urban uh, spatial planning, and the invasion of the free open space by all sorts of things, roads and buildings and all of that. And it's very difficult to have solid environment and climate policies if the basis of spatial planning and land use is not done very well. It complicates things. You have to retrofit things. It makes it more expensive. So good spatial planning, good urban planning is absolutely critical to come to strong environment and climate policies. Couldn't be faster. Thank you very much, Irene Yassas. Um, as I belong to the previous uh, session, 
uh, for the sake of uh, uh, for saving the time, I will be quite brief and uh, sorry for maybe skipping quite fast uh, some slides. Uh, but now we uh, will turn to uh, a little bit uh, more Nordic uh, country as uh, Estonia is, and I will a little bit uh, introduce our policies and practices concerning uh, water in Estonian uh, landscapes. Um, Estonia is quite a small country. Its territory is uh, 45,000 square kilometers, uh, but it is uh, full of different uh, coastal habitats and a lot of islands and quite um, long uh, coastline we have as well. Um, there are a lot of lakes and uh, also we have uh, quite uh, big uh, sized lakes as well, like Lake Papsi in, in our uh, eastern um, border, what is um, uh, fourth from its size in Europe. We have quite a lot of rivers, but mostly they look like, as you see down here in the middle a picture, small ones with quite a um, small volume of uh, water within, but uh, also we have some quite uh, a number of um, lo long rivers as well. We have a spring, springs, different types, Kartik lakes and rivers, which come and appear in the landscape, as, as they have quite a different uh, type of hydrology of uh, other uh, water bodies. And uh, something what I also want to uh, tell you about is floodings in Estonia. Um, you can see on the left um, side uh, two pictures. Uh, uh, these are natural uh, river floodings, which uh, mostly take place in spring and autumn time. In spring, they appear when uh, the winter has been very snowy and it gets warm, and all the snow melts very quickly. And even if there are uh, some um, heavy rains, then you can see pictures like this. Uh, normally, this is absolutely dry land, and, but uh, during this, uh, like we call in Estonia, fifth season, uh, flooded season, uh, we have this uh, very interesting uh, natural uh, flooded landscapes, and um, uh, this is the reason why we have in these areas very huge alluvial meadows, uh, wet forests, and um, uh, different mires, and uh, we have designated these quite huge areas as protected areas to have the, to maintain the um, uh, water and uh, related uh, ecosystems, and it also helps to avoid uh, floodings in uh, city areas, in urban areas. And also quite exceptional case in Estonia, as you see some uh, houses also may be situated uh, in these areas, and uh, you can believe me that people don't want to move away from, from these uh, places because they have lived there for decades, for generations, and it is quite interesting mixture of nature and culture what is uh, uh, needed to live in this kind of habitats. And for example, we have um, uh, one type of uh, canoe, what is very exceptional for these flooded areas, uh, which is used only there and prepared there. So it is uh, also like cultural heritage what is created uh, through this uh, habitat type. I will quickly mention also uh, different uh, legal instruments what uh, work together to protect and manage our landscapes and, and water. Water Act is mostly uh, due, um, dealing with um, uh, water quality issues, uh, water management plans are prepared uh, to, to work with this. Nature Conservation Act is more on water bodies and uh, their coasts and, and banks as a holistic view for landscape. And Planning Act is more or less to uh, balance uh, different land uses and, and either protection and uh, uh, settlement areas and to give rules for that. 
And uh, I also uh, can mention that um, uh, this kind of uh, very uh, unintense um, use of uh, water bodies like uh, swimming, fishing, uh, unintense water abstraction, this is public uh, use, uh, what is allowed. And what is also maybe quite exceptional uh, in Estonian case is that we have a nationwide uh, uh, such regulation that each um, water body, um, including also uh, sea, uh, coast areas, shores, uh, have a shore bank paths that uh, should be available for public access to water bodies. So we can tell about uh, nature for people, as as colleague uh, was uh, in the morning session uh, telling us about how, how to get access to um, nature. And there are several uh, special use uh, issues where you need uh, permits uh, for using water bodies. We can, it, it, it's all kind of activities which maintain or create um, or change quite um, a lot uh, water bodies. Uh, for example, also we can mention uh, hydroelectric uh, energy uh, producing. Um, we quite um, a lot um, water bodies protect in Estonia as well. Uh, for example, uh, uh, from our territorial sea, 27% uh, uh, is designated as protected areas for protection of um, um, marine habitats, um, important bird areas, and, and etc. And um, also we protect terrestrial habitats at shores and banks. These are also very interesting elements of landscape where culture and uh, nature meet again. It is, um, here you can have a look. Uh, these uh, open landscapes have um, been characteristic to Estonia for hundreds of years. And our country is making uh, quite a lot of efforts to keep uh, this traditional use, mowing and grazing in coastal areas. And we also use EU agri-environmental scheme subsidies to support people who, who um, make this uh, work. And sometimes also appears that some uh, degraded uh, landscapes may be quite valuable later on for, for nature. Uh, here you see one good example of uh, one abundant sand quarry area in Estonia was uh, discovered by quite uh, threatened spe species in Estonia. And at the check dude, you can see in the middle picture a small animal hiding there in its cave. And, and this um, area uh, has uh, evolved uh, such nice uh, water bodies that it is very, very uh, suitable for uh, this um, amphibian species. I will skip this one. It's giving uh, overview actually how Nature Conservation Act is uh, saying the objectives of protection of shores and banks. Um, some other thing I want to tell uh, quickly is uh, that um, our legal regulations um, uh, work for that, uh, to uh, preserve um, landscapes for recreation, for, for people to use. Um, and that's why we have uh, several, uh, let's say, protection uh, zones on shores and banks everywhere where they, they appear. And um, their rights uh, depends uh, on the size of uh, the water body, like a spring might have quite uh, uh, narrow zones of protection, but larger lakes, for example, uh, uh, more wider ones. Um, and uh, these uh, zones are designated to protect um, water, to keep water quality, uh, for example, against diffuse pollution and erosion. And we also have this Building exclusion zone, that's number three in the picture you can see. Uh, and the idea of this um, zone is uh, to avoid um, uh, of construction of new buildings. Um, you can restore some old buildings, uh, but uh, we try to avoid uh, new buildings. 
And two challenges, what we have, I quickly mentioned two last slides. Um, uh, Estonia is currently in situations that we don't have any uh, wind parks in sea areas. We have in uh, mainland, uh, but uh, currently uh, we are preparing a special plan for maritime areas. And we also have now discussions about um, how to balance all different uh, uses of uh, sea. Uh, where to place renewable energy um, parks, uh, where to have uh, marine habitats and um, important areas of uh, migratory birds. And it also um, has to do with perceptions of people to landscape, to seascapes, as they are used to seascapes, as you see in the uh, bottom um, picture. And, and um, so it, it all is quite quite new experience for us to, to deal with this wind box issue. And uh, so, some other challenge is concerned with uh, uh, water protection um, framework directive, uh, which um, uh, needs um, or asks for um, good status of uh, water bodies. And it is a challenge for us because we have quite a lot of dams on rivers still. Our country is quite flat, and maybe these um, uh, jams are not quite powerful, but still there are. And um, we also have some uh, quite good um, examples where you can um, also remove uh, some jams to, uh, to uh, achieve the good quality uh, of rivers. For example, this case here, you see uh, now uh, how how it has gone, and then in this uh, case, we have had possibility to do it uh, because uh, landowners have been very supportive. We have had possibility to have the general um, uh, outlook quite similar as uh, was uh, the river with the dam, but now the river is in natural status again. So this was quite brief and fast overview of Estonian case, so thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, again, I will try and be brief, um, as I know we're running a little late. Um, I'm from Historic England. We're the public body that looks after the historic environment in England. Um, and I wanted to share with you some challenges that we're facing and some ways in which we're trying to address them. And I'm hoping that some of you in the audience might want to um, join us in sharing some of these ideas or be interested in what we're doing. So please do come find me if you want to know any more. I'm going to have to rush through fairly quickly. Um, it's also my first time engaging with the European Landscape Convention, and it's fantastic, so I will definitely be back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so water is at the heart of the main challenge in the UK that's facing us with climate change. Our climate change risk assessment says that flooding and coastal changes um, risk to business, communities, and infrastructure is, is the, the top priority for our, our future climate change adaptation planning. In addition to that, uh, we are also reviewing how we approach our flood and coastal erosion risk management. Um, our river basin management plans and strategies are being reviewed. And there is an increasing interest in natural flood management approaches. And also, there's a recognition of the importance of engaging with people and that there's some real challenges around engaging with the population who are at risk of flooding. So we know, I think it's something like 80% of people at risk of flooding don't think that they're at risk, which is a bit of an issue. I see this as an opportunity for the historic environment and landscape to help with some of these challenges. And uh, some of you may have noticed that we also have some self-inflicted challenges at the moment which are leading to a need to review a lot of our environmental policies. And underpinning the approach to these environmental policies are uh, the concept of public and environmental goods and services. 
sometimes known as natural capital um, and ecosystem services approaches. And what we know is that the historic environment has been absent from a lot of these um, considerations, and this is something that we're working to address. So we've been thinking about how the historic environment is valuable in environmental terms, as well as how the environment is valuable in, in cultural terms. Um, and we're also working with our government department, uh, Digital Communities, Media and Sport is the name of that department, to look at how we might be able to develop a cultural capital approach, which would be a similar structure to natural capital. Um, and another strand that we've been looking at, which is related to those first two, is how we can learn from the past to plan from the future, plan for the future. We've heard that a few times, and um, we'll, we've commissioned some pieces of work, um, which I'm just going to quickly share with you the titles um, to help us develop these approaches. So these are a series of pilot studies looking at natural capital and the historic environment. And I think you might notice water is, uh, water is, is re closely related to quite a number of these. We have some that are looking specifically at marine environments. Um, we have some that are looking at landscapes where they've identified the value of historic boundaries in helping reduce flood risk, managing um, runoff of water. Um, and we have others which are looking specifically at inland waters and, and river valleys and historic water management. These are either published and publicly available or will be very shortly. So if you're interested, do get in touch. And the, it's our intention that we will use these to develop guidance for how the historic environment can, can fit within uh, natural capital frameworks. And finally, I wanted to share one particular project that we commissioned um, in an attempt to try and uh, develop an approach to characterize watercourses. In England, our landscape is very heavily managed and changed and the result of human activity over thousands of years. And there are very few watercourses that aren't significantly altered due to human activity. But we were interested in whether we can take or develop an approach that's comparable to historic landscape characterization or historic seascape characterization that we could apply to inland waterways um, and, and try and use that to help support engagement with natural flood management and cat, um, catchment management. We're at a fairly early stage in this process, so if anyone has any projects or ideas they'd like to share with us, we'd be really grateful. Um, but this is uh, the river that we looked at first was a, called the Stour. It's in the southwest of, of England in a, an area called Dorset. And uh, that was it. So do get in touch if you have anything you want to share. Um, I'd look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I represent uh, the Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources of Ukraine. Uh, I'll speak uh, briefly of policy and practice uh, relating to, uh, to water and landscape in Ukraine. So, Ukraine has uh, gradually ex uh, approximated its legislation to European Union law and uh, policy in the field of protection of uh, the environment uh, and national resources management in accordance uh, to its commi commitment. Uh, the association agreement uh, between uh, uh, Europe uh, Union and uh, Ukraine. Among other, Ukraine is implementing the EU Water Framework Directive, uh, included elements related to water and landscape. In particular, in 2016, uh, the Parliament of Ukraine adopted the amendment uh, to the Water Court of Ukraine relating to integrated river basin principle of water resources management. In 2017, uh, the Cabinet of Ministry of Ukraine approved the order of um, development of river basin management plan. The Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources uh, approved the standards uh, regu regulation of basin councils. 
Uh, citizens, uh, ac according to the above mentioned regulation, 13 uh, basin councils have been established in Ukraine. In particular, for River Dnipro, uh, Bug, Prut, uh, Danube, uh, Dniester, Tisa, and other. Each basic council consists uh, of representatives of uh, regional <laughs> government bodies, municipalities, uh, civil society organization, private sector, uh, and um, scientific institution and uh, other stakeholders. Among the main tasks of the basin council are um, participation in development of river basic management plan, coordination and facilitation uh, the implementation of river basin management plan as well as plans, program, and um, project related to sustainable development of river basin territories. Facilitation the development of implementation of technical assessment programs and project uh, fundraising and uh, attracting investment for improvement on the ecological status of river basin. Assessment of the river basin management plan implementation. Currently, several international projects are being implemented in Ukraine to support national policy related to integrated water resources management. Among them is um, EU founding project supported to Ukraine in approximation of the EU environment Aquis. It's envisaged uh, that this project will support the elaboration and implementation of river basin management plan, as well as river sub-basin management plans. According to the newly developed and uh, update national legal framework, uh, this uh, river basin uh, management plan is to include provision to water and uh, landscape. Thank you. Let's go. Eh, bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, para terminar ya con este eh, tercer taller que viene de la mañana, eh, mi compañera Irena García y yo, Carmen Venegas, del Centro de Estudios Paisaje y Territorio, vamos a hacer muy brevemente la relatoría de las comunicaciones que se han presentado a, a este tercer taller. Eh, estas comunicaciones, eh, como dice el nombre del taller, están mayoritariamente referidas a los instrumentos de protección, de gestión y de ordenación eh, de los paisajes del agua eh, existente y en este sentido eh, hemos incluido todas aquellas que señala el programa, si bien es verdad que hay algunas que eh, no tenían eh, cabida temáticamente en los otros talleres y también eh, están en este. Por tanto, tenemos un conjunto de comunicaciones de diversas temáticas, es una miscelánea, pero todas de mucho interés. Son 13 comunicaciones, más otros proyectos de investigación en formato vídeo y en formato póster. Aquí tienen el conjunto de ellas. Queremos que, todo, que todas las personas que hayan presentado una comunicación se, se sientan presentes. Como les decía, eh, la temática es muy variada y de alguna manera, por sintetizar, hemos intentado agruparlas temáticamente eh, en tres entre grupos. El primero de ellos está relacionado eh, con los instrumentos normativos y de planificación expresamente ¿no? sobre protección, eh, gestión y ordenación de los paisajes del agua. El segundo eh, recoge aquellas comunicaciones relativas a la percepción y a las representaciones de los paisajes, eh, considerando prácticamente todas las aproximaciones posibles, tanto manifestaciones artísticas, culturales, como gráficas, cartografías, sistemas de visibilidad. Y finalmente, en un tercer grupo eh, de comunicaciones están aquellas que hacen un especial hincapié en los efectos del cambio climático y de otros fenómenos naturales centrados en unos ámbitos paisajísticos eh, concretos. En estas primeras eh, voy a destacar solo una breve idea de cada una de ellas, espero que sea un fiel resumen de lo que han presentado. Eh, tenemos la primera de ellas que recoge esa triple dimensión del agua desde una aproximación jurídica 
eh, en España y en Andalucía, entendiéndolo como un bien de dominio público eh, que está regulado por una ley muy precisa que, de, que defiende o que, se, o que mantiene ese espíritu eh, de colectividad y de uso público de este recurso. El agua como un recurso natural, en clara consonancia con la perspectiva eh, comunitaria y con las políticas medioambientales europeas. Y finalmente como un recurso paisajístico que se articula y se garantiza a través de la evaluación ambiental. Una segunda comunicación está referida expresamente a la idoneidad de la estrategia de paisaje de Andalucía, que se aprobó por Consejo de Gobierno en el año 2012, como un verdadero instrumento para abordar el tratamiento de las intervenciones en los paisajes del agua en Andalucía, mediante la coordinación de las políticas eh, públicas sectoriales y la acción conjunta de todas las consejerías eh, y administraciones que están involucradas. Y en este sentido, esta comunicación recoge eh, la, los distintos objetivos y líneas estratégicas donde tendrían cabida estos paisajes del agua. Y finalmente, una última comunicación que destaca la importancia que tiene el agua en la configuración física del territorio en Andalucía y aborda eh, su utilidad como un recurso fundamental de ordenación territorial, identificando las muchas dimensiones que este recurso puede ofrecer en la planificación, como estructurante del territorio, como soporte de conectividad ecológica, como un recurso de diversidad paisajística, eh, como potencialidad, por su potencialidad en el uso público, etc. Para ello, ejemplifica esta cuestión a través del plan de ordenación del territorio de la aglomeración urbana eh, de Sevilla, el planeamiento subregional de la Sevilla metropolitana, donde se identifica la red de drenaje como un elemento de primer orden que ha favorecido eh, de alguna manera eh, preservar algunos espacios de la dinámica urbanizadora propia de de este ámbito y ha jugado un, pa un papel importante en eh, la configuración del paisaje metropolitano y en la red de, espacio, de espacios libres. Eh, el segundo grupo de comunicaciones de este taller eh, aborda una interesante temática, Gracias. que es la de las percepciones y representaciones de los paisajes del agua, haciendo un amplio recorrido que va desde representaciones artísticas clásicas, tanto literarias como iconográficas, y reflexiones de corte más filosófico sobre la estética del agua, hasta un conjunto de comunicaciones que tratan algunas de las herramientas actuales que se utilizan para la representación y percepción de estos paisajes, eh, como cartografía, ortofotografía, sistemas de visibilidad, composiciones fotográficas o los nuevos medios audio audiovisuales transmedia. En primer lugar, existen dos comunicaciones referidas expresamente a las representaciones artísticas de los paisajes del agua. La primera de ellas hace un breve recorrido por algunas referencias poéticas al agua y sus paisajes en las distintas etapas de la literatura española, de Gonzalo de Berceo a Juan Ramón Jiménez, entendiendo que esta experiencia poética de la percepción de los paisajes del agua les otorga una connotación cultural. La segunda de estas comunicaciones plantea, a partir del análisis de representaciones artísticas de paisajes costeros, cómo la plasmación de determinados paisajes en obras de arte deriva en un aumento de su reconocimiento y su valor patrimonial. Eh, esta idea se ejemplifica destacando la pintura de Monet pueden ver, y su contribución a la conservación y protección de los paisajes costeros representados, y propone trasladar esta idea a los paisajes costeros españoles a partir de otros pintores destacados como Sorolla. Asimismo, una tercera comunicación en esta línea relaciona la belleza y la estética de los paisajes del agua con sus valores religiosos y simbólicos a lo largo de la historia, entendiendo que en la actualidad se le han incorporado valores sociales y ecológicos. Esta idea la incorpora también a proyectos de paisajismo, tal y como pueden ver en el póster que también ha presentado la autora de esta comunicación en los que considera que esta visión holística es imprescindible para trabajar a favor de la sostenibilidad. Eh, como decíamos antes, otro grupo de comunicaciones dentro de esta línea temática de las percepciones y representaciones se centran en las distintas herramientas de expresión gráfica que son útiles para representar los, valo los valores de los paisajes del agua en la actualidad. De gran interés en este sentido resulta la comunicación relativa a las islas del Guadalquivir, en las que se proponen nuevas formas de expresión gráfica que permiten destacar los valores y cualidades del agua en los paisajes, como el fotomontaje, el collage o la cartografía interpretativa de paisaje. 
En esta línea se encuadra también la comunicación relativa a la visibilidad y teledetección como herramientas que pueden establecer relaciones cuantitativas entre la percepción visual y la transformación de los paisajes. Para ello se establece un indicador específico sobre el comportamiento de los ecosistemas ante la presencia o ausencia de agua en un intervalo temporal determinado. Igualmente, en la comunicación y vídeos que se han presentado sobre los mosaicos de regadío, aquí tienen un fotograma del vídeo que pueden ver afuera, eh, se plantea el potencial de las imágenes satélite como herramienta para el seguimiento de la evolución de los paisajes y su utilidad en la gestión del territorio. Finalmente, en la última comunicación de este grupo, centrada en las huertas del sur de la región urbana de Madrid, se muestra la incorporación de herramientas audiovisuales transmedia como un componente del proceso de patrimonialización del agua en el paisaje. Esta iniciativa, materializada en la creación del Parque Agrario de Fuenlabrada y vinculada a la puesta en valor del patrimonio territorial y paisajístico, puso en marcha el proyecto web interactivo Liquid Water Cultures, cuyo objetivo es la construcción de un archivo transmedia de la memoria del agua y el paisaje de la zona, integrando por, integrado por diferentes contenidos como fotografías, cartas o relatos, entre otros. Y ya finalmente, el último grupo de comunicaciones, el último conjunto que, que hemos establecido, es aquel que hace especial hincapié en los efectos del cambio climático o de otros fenómenos naturales en ámbitos paisajísticos concretos. En ese sentido, tenemos una primera de ellas relativa a las salinas continentales del centro de Andalucía, que recoge la síntesis de un estudio de investigación sobre este endemismo ibérico, ¿no? que se encuentra en clara recesión eh, debido, eh, entre otras circunstancias, no solo, pero entre otras circunstancias, a los efectos del cambio climático. ¿no? Analiza cómo la reducción de las precipitaciones y el incremento de las temperaturas medias en este ámbito eh, están potenciando los efectos de sequía y la reducción y desaparición de las salmueras eh, naturales. Eh, eh, una segunda eh, comunicación eh, también aborda el, los efectos del cambio climático en un espacio concreto, el de la, la región de la Albufeira en el, en el Algarve, en, Pol, en Portugal, donde eh, se destaca eh, el riesgo que hay de inundación existente en los propios territorios eh, mediterráneos, donde hay un patrón de precipitaciones torrenciales que hay, y, y hay un gran flujo de, de, de agua eh, de mucha entidad concentrados en periodos reducidos de tiempo. ¿no? Si eh, estas inundaciones recurrentes que se ven potenciadas por el cambio climático, además no van acompañadas de una eh, urbanización respetuosa, pues es verdad que mm, se sufren numerosas inundaciones y lo pone de manifiesto esta comunicación haciendo un recorrido de las distintas que, que ha sufrido y destacando la última eh, del año eh, 2015. Mm, señala el, el autor, los autores, perdón, que a partir de esta última se desarrolló un plan de drenaje que de alguna manera incidía de nuevo en buscar soluciones eh, que ya se estaban utilizando, pero no iba a la raíz del problema, como es la, artificia, la artificialización perdón, completa de la cuenca, la supresión de los ecosistemas naturales que tiene asociado y, en definitiva, unos usos inadecuados eh, para el territorio. Para ello, eh, incorporó estas imágenes que son suficientemente gráficas. Y ya finalmente, y en esta consideración de la importancia de actuar sobre los efectos del cambio climático, existe una comunicación más que plantea la necesidad de ajustar los umbrales de medición de precipitaciones actuales de manera que se pueda acercar de una manera más certera a los episodios torrenciales que existen en lugares muy concretos eh, como eh, la media montaña mediterránea y la comunicación propone un nuevo eh, umbral de medición eh, para estas precipitaciones de corta duración y de intensidad eh, muy extrema. Eh, bueno, finalmente y de manera conclusiva, eh, atendiendo a las comunicaciones presentadas en este tercer taller, eh, se han destacado la, las siguientes ideas. Eh, con la ratificación del Convenio Europeo de Paisaje por España, en Andalucía ha habido un interés por incorporar el concepto de paisaje en las políticas públicas con documentos como la Estrategia de Paisaje de Andalucía. Igualmente, el concepto emergente de paisaje está cada vez más presente en los documentos jurídicos y normativos, en los que sí existe ya una larga tradición y un extenso recorrido en relación con los recursos hídricos. Por otra parte, los efectos del cambio climático, cada vez más evidentes, 
son especialmente significativos en el caso de los paisajes asociados al agua por su vulnerabilidad y fragilidad, siendo necesario establecer instrumentos precisos que palien los efectos negativos asociados a los mismos. Otra idea a destacar es que la red hidrográfica es un elemento de primer orden en la conformación del territorio y su consideración en la planificación física ofrece una oportunidad para potenciar y poner en valor los recursos paisajísticos asociados al agua. Asimismo, se está desarrollando una nueva línea de trabajo eh, relativa a mejorar la legibilidad y capacidad interpretativa de la cartografía contemporánea de paisajes y de otras manifestaciones gráficas de gran expresividad formal y utilidad como instrumentos de protección, gestión y ordenación. Y finalmente, indicar que en el proceso de cualificación de los paisajes del agua, las representaciones artísticas juegan un importante papel en la patrimonialización de los mismos y en su reconocimiento social, contribuyendo decididamente a la protección de estos recursos. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes.